started then. So sure. I want to take this opportunity to thank my special guest for the McKinley Memorial Library. This is Linda Mishayevsky, author and distinguished professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at The Ohio State University, who today is gracious enough to discuss with us women detectives in popular culture. And I turn the floor over now to you, Linda. Oh, hi there. I am hi. delighted to be here. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and get started with uh, a PowerPoint. And here we are. Okay. Uh, I am delighted to be talking about the woman detective in popular culture. Uh, this all came from a research project that I did that resulted in a book called uh, Hard Boiled and High Heeled, The Woman Detective in Popular Culture. And I wrote this book purely for fun. Okay? <laughs> I'm a professor and I have to do research and uh, write books for a living. But I got to say, this one was done as a fan. By fan, I mean that back in the days when uh, Sue Grafton was writing her alphabet series, I would go out and buy the hardback. I couldn't wait for the paperback. I couldn't wait for the library copy. I was, I was there. I wanted to uh, uh, be among the first to find out what she, what she had written. Uh, this is a photo of me with best-selling crime writer Val McDermott. We were in England a couple of years ago in a very, very sweltering summer, and I was so thrilled to meet her. I said, oh, Miss McDermott, um, I'm a melting fangirl. And she said, oh, no, no, it's just the heat. It's just the heat. <laughs> she, was, she, was, she was great and very kind. Uh, but I have always loved mysteries. Uh, I've always loved detective stories. Um, used to read Sherlock Holmes, of course, and Nancy Drew when I was a little kid. Uh, but of course, as I became a professor, and especially a professor of gender studies, I began to be more and more curious about where the idea of detectives came from and why it is that when we say the word detective, what usually comes to mind is a guy in a hat and a raincoat, kind of like the, uh, uh, the, the photo here. So, so what's the deal about detectives? The word detective comes from Renaissance English. Dick you meant a man, as in like every Tom, Dick and Harry. Um, and then in the 1890s, British military slang began to use the word as a term for the male part. And that was kind of underground and wasn't around a lot. Uh, but also what was happening was that there was such a thing as a detective and Dick became a contraction for uh, uh, detective. So uh, when we talk about detectives and use the slang word Dick, which I think actually only happens in the 1930s, there's a very kind of masculine uh, 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 story behind why we, why we do that. Uh, sometimes when I teach these 1930s uh, uh, detective stories by people like Lou Ayers, uh, the students find this hilarious because the, um, there are always paragraphs that say, well, said the dick, what do you think happened here? Well, said the other dick, it looks like the perp came in through the window. So my students think it's very, very funny. Actually, it is very, very funny. <laughs> um, but the, uh, uh, the, the term itself seems to be masculinized. Uh, and think about how uh, private detective, you know, seems to be, uh, you know, a, a word that actually means sex to male in pop culture. Think of all the sexy guys through the eras who have played detectives, uh, beginning, of course, with Humphrey Bogart, but all the way up to Brad Pitt. Morgan Freeman, he's a detective like in every other movie. He's, <laughs> he's, he's always a detective. Um, but how about the woman who's a detective and the woman who shows up where we expect the man to be? Um, now, I'm going to use as an example here The Silence of the Lambs, which is, of course, a very famous, famous woman detective story. There's Clarice, the young rookie, and she's the rookie for the FBI, and she's the investigator, and she does outsmart all the guys, and she's the one who figures it out, uh, and she, she does it all by herself. Um, it's a movie in which she's clearly... A heroine. And the book is like that too. I mean, she, she's absolutely um, uh, someone that, you know, you look up to and she's astonishing. And there seems to be kind of a wholehearted embrace of her as the heroine. However, there are some anxieties about the woman as detective. And I'll tell you where you can find it. Look at this 
photo. This was the very well-known photo that was used in all the press releases for, and posters for the movie. Now, the butterfly there is actually a, a moth. The death's head moth is an important part of the plot. You might remember if you uh, saw the movie or read the book. Now, look at this, the little skeleton face, the skull face that's there in the middle of this. Do you see, do you see that? Okay, if you look very, very closely, it would be very difficult to do this, but if, if, you, if you look closely, this is what you see. It's actually not a skull. It's from a Salvador Dali uh, art photograph called In Voluptate Moors, or In Love with Death. And it's very clear from this that death is the female body, that death is uh, uh, female sexuality, female sexiness. That is really pretty creepy. So let, let, me, let me go back again. Okay, you see, see this, this skeleton head there? Okay, do you see it in there? Uh, you really have to look with uh, a, a little looking glass in order to, to, to possibly see that. But somebody had this in mind. Somebody designing this was thinking, okay, even though this is a woman who's the heroine and she's you know, clear cut, and there's nothing ambiguous about her, uh, there's still something about this that's ambiguous or that causes us anxiety. Because certainly this is a picture of male anxiety. <laughs> what is death? It is the female body. Okay, um, in spite of this, in spite of this kind of anxiety, the woman detective has been around very, very much. I'm gonna show that she's been around um, actually for centuries, but at least since the 1980s, the whole detective genre has really been revolutionized by gender. A very early clue about this was Nancy Drew. When I do this uh, talk in person, I always ask how many of us were Nancy Drew readers when we were young, and just about everybody raises their hand. Uh, Nancy Drew was great, and she was she was revolutionary for her time. You know, she was around in the 1920s. Back in those days, uh, if a woman was the main character in a book, she was married or dead by the end of the book. I mean, those are the two things that could possibly happen to her. <laughs> In the best case scenario, you know, she was with Mr. Wright. If not, she had thrown herself into the train. But uh, there was Nancy Drew, who was the heroine who, whose main thing was adventure rather than romance. Remember, she had a boyfriend, Ned. And he would show up every once in a while. But Ned never rescued her. Never, never. He was never even part of the detective plots. And it would have been really disappointing if she had married Ned at the end of one of those books we, there would have been a revolution. We said, no, you can't do this. We didn't want her to get married. We didn't want that to be her story. We wanted her to have the story of being very, very smart and being able to outwit the police and everybody else <laughs> and solve these mysteries in her small town. So we can see that there was a yearning for the woman detective, despite the the masculinity of the detective genre. And we can see that Nancy Drew was a really good example of how it would be very popular when that happened. Okay, so let's go into the kind of the history of the detective story and where this started. Um, it begins actually in the 1840s, okay? And that's when real life police began to specialize in homicide. Uh, up until that time, there weren't people who were, um, whose special job was to be a detective who was on a case looking for a murder. The reason is before the development of big cities, if there was a murder, everybody knew who did it, okay? <laughs> it was like, there was a fight at the tavern, uh, there was a tragedy in somebody's house, but it wasn't until cities began to grow that it became possible for someone to commit a murder and then disappear into the crowd, and that, uh, that it was possible to be murdered by a stranger. That would only happen in big cities. So around that time, around the 1840s, there really were police who began to specialize in this. And that's around the time when Edgar Allan Poe wrote the very first mystery story. I wonder if people still read this in high school. We were always assigned to, uh, to do that in, in high school classes. Murders in the Rue Morgue, very first fictional uh, private investigator was Monsieur Dupin. Okay, the story two women brutally murdered. I don't know if you've read this short story recently, but the, the story opens with two women's bodies found on the floor in a locked room. So it seems impossible that anyone could possibly have gotten into this room and, um, and murdered them. But their bodies are so torn up that they're unrecognizable. And this ends up being part of the pattern that very frequently women are the victims. 
Okay, our women are being chased or pursued or threatened or are endangered in some way. But it certainly begins with this way, with the women who are the victims. Uh, the detective is the brooding outsider who outsmarts the police. <laughs> And we love this character. We love this. So think about the number of detective stories you've seen where the hero is someone who is not part of the police, or he antagonizes the police, or the police are very suspicious of him or her. Uh, this kind of brooding loner, okay, who ends up solving mystery. Wow. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe is the one who thought of this, and he's the one who deserves the credit for it. Um, the dark side is that Dupin thinks like a criminal. And of course, that becomes part of the story too, and part of the allure. Uh, so that even in the um, uh, Sue Grafton novels, if you've read those, uh, 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 Kinsey Milhone, her detective, is always thinking like a criminal to the point that she does a lot of uh, trespassing and breaking and entering that she shouldn't do. <laughs> and she kind of enjoys that, that part of it. But this thing about uh, the, the cop having the dark side or the detective having a dark side, that's certainly a literary trope that we've, um, that we've grown up with. Um, the most famous detective shortly thereafter, of course, was Sherlock Holmes in the 1890s. Once again, an outsider, he's not part of the police. The police come to consult him. They need his help. Uh, but because he's the outsider and the loner, he knows everything and he's the one who's able to solve the crime. Um, he was the armchair detective, and this means that he did not use violence. Uh, I think in some newer renditions of Sherlock Holmes, he has a gun, but the original Sherlock did not, of course. He used deduction and logic. Um, so, you know, didn't use violence. He was cool and rational. Um, his dark side, he was drawn to crime. He was very antisocial, and of course he used cocaine. So if if you read those original stories, every once in a while, Watson chides, Watson chides him about this. Uh, but there's you know the dark side there, and uh, once again, that dark side becomes the alluring part of the detective character. Contemporary Sherlock's, um, more action, but really the same formula. Uh, if you haven't seen the Benedict Cumberbatch Sherlock's, I bet the library has, has copies of, of, of this. Um, those are the ones they ran about seven, eight years ago. Uh, there was a, they ran for maybe four or five years. Oh, they were excellent. They were, they were just excellent. And um, Cumberbatch played a very dashing, but very dark, very brooding, very neurotic Sherlock. Um, more action, but same formula. This guy knows more, can outsmart the police. The visual dynamic of the detective, one of the main things that I'm going to really emphasize today, the detective is the person who sees things that other people miss. And this is the main, a main characteristic of the detective. So if you read the original Sherlock Holmes's, uh, Watson is always saying to Sherlock, um, uh, well, this guy seems to be a suspect, but you know, I'm not sure exactly what his, what his story is. And, and Sherlock will say, well, I know quite a bit about him just by looking at him. That man owns a large dog and frequently takes him for walks in a certain kind of forest. And Watson will say, oh my gosh, how could you possibly know such a thing? And Sherlock, of course, would be looking at uh, stains of mud on the guy's, uh, the guy's trousers, uh, bits of leaf that could only come from a certain kind of forest. Um, the Cumberbatch character always did this, and there was always a kind of interesting visual device that showed us kind of going into his eyes, his eyes seeing things. Um, remember the old Columbo that was on TV? Columbo would go into a room and say things like, hmm, there used to be a picture on that wall. So uh, he... He, could, he was even seeing things that weren't there, okay? He could see kind of an outline of dust. Oh, that used to be a, that used to be a photo. But this thing about visual uh, observation and being very, very sharp about seeing things, um, this ends up being really a key to the detective and is key to uh, what I'm gonna talk about today. Now, in the, by the 1930s, we've got the hard-boiled detective, and um, these are the series that were by uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, uh, Ross MacDonald, Mickey Spillane. Um, these guys wrote series, and this was really important. The same detective showed up over and over and over again, and this was new to have this kind of a character who would have different stories, but it would be a recurring character. Uh, these books are all still around. They still sell. My husband owned a bookstore for a long, long time in Columbus. He was always selling these books. They never, ever went out of fashion. Um, and uh, we probably know maybe Sam Spade the best because uh, that was the Humphrey Bogart, Bogart character, and that was that was a couple movies. But these these series just went 
on and on and on. This was the hard-boiled detective, as opposed to Sherlock, who was cool, rational, and deductive. The hard-boiled private investigator was rough, violent, attracted to bad, bad women, the femme fatale. Um, if you can read that little cartoon there, he's saying, no loot, no deal, your time's up. This is where you get your sister right now. Um, and if you remember at the end of the Maltese Falcon, uh, the Humphrey Bogart, Bogart character uh, has an affair with the woman that she's the prime suspect and he sends her die and you're gonna hang the baby, he says, you're gonna hang. So very, very different from uh, the Sherlock's who were very kind of cool and very distant from, from what they're doing. But the, the, the American version of this, the American PI of course is, is right in there uh, and right in with the action. Now, just from what I've said so far, you can see that there are, are kind of rules that have developed around the classic detective story. Um, the detective is a man, and what he's noted for is his superior mind, that he sees things other people can't see and um, generally figures things out faster than anybody else. The villain is usually also a male, a good match for the detective. So of course, with um, Sherlock Holmes, it was Moriarty, okay, who was, the, who was smart enough to be a good match for the detective. Women, hmm, well, the woman might be the body, she might be the victim, okay, as, as in the body on the floor in that original um, uh, 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 Edgar Allan Poe story. Or the victim is the bad girl, the femme fatale. Once again, she's known for her body. <laughs> so if you look at uh, what we have here, we have men equals mind, female equals body. Wow, that does not sound very liberating, <laughs> does it? And once again, it also sounds like the detective story is gonna be a story that is so male, so masculine, that certainly women wouldn't have a place in it except as bodies or as bad girls. Now, in pop culture, while the detective has been a favorite on screen and on TV. And here's the thing to notice. Um, the detective does not have to be good looking. Here, let me see if I can move my face out of here so you can see this better. Um, the detective doesn't have to be a good looking guy. <laughs> not whatsoever. Um, and of course, he doesn't have to be good looking because he's the one who does the looking. So we can have really goofy looking people. I mean, I, I love these actors. I love every one of them. Uh, Jeff Goldblum uh, to um, uh, Tony Shalhoub in, in, in Monk. They're just, they're, they're really, really good. But they don't, ha they don't have to be glamorous, right? And if, you know, if you, if you think about it, you know, it's, because they're the ones who are doing the looking, not the ones who are being looked at. And so, you know, Buddy Epson could be a hundred years old. Frank Cannon could be um, very overweight and, and, and balding, Telly Savalas bald. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because their job isn't to be looked at. So this is gonna be really important when we look at what happens to the woman detective in pop culture, as we'll see in just a little bit. Now, the Hardball Detective works really well as a cultural hero. He's the outsider, the maverick. We love outsiders who were heroes. We love that. Um, in politics too, he's an outsider, he's good, okay? So the outsider is someone who is not part of the system. So he has that for him. He's a man of action. Well, he can be a superhero, that, that works. We have male superheroes. He has a shady past. Well, okay, the John Juan, uh, the guy with um, uh, lots of women in the background, that's perfectly okay for the hero to have that. Um, his job entails violence. Well, that means he's macho. Okay, that's that's going to work okay, too. Um, he's a would-be outlaw. We love would-be outlaws. Butch Cassidy, <laughs> okay, for example. Um, he can treat women badly. It's not a crime. You know, once again, he can get away with it because he's the outsider who's the hero. So there's lots and lots of reasons why the detective as uh, a literary hero and as a pop culture hero, movies, TV, why it would be a really, really popular character. Uh, look at this list of names of TV programs. Uh, these are all individual male guys who were detectives. Uh, some of them are names of guns, you know, Canon, Magnum PI, <laughs> uh, Beretta, I think is a, is, is a gun too. But it's the loner, right? You know, it's the individual. You know, he's not part of the team. This is what makes him so glamorous. He's outside the team. Again, that's why he can solve murders so well. So what happens to women in the mystery genre? Well, let, let's get some background on this. You know, as I said, with, with the clue being um, Nancy Drew, women were never out of it entirely. So there were authors, even back in the 19th century, who were imagining women 
who were picking up a candle or picking up a flashlight and going exactly where they weren't supposed to go and solving mysteries. Um, Agatha Christie, Miss Marple, you know, for example, uh, Dor Dorothy Sayers. Um, if, if you don't know these names, they're easy to look up. I'm sure the library has them. Uh, these are all people who imagined characters who were solving mysteries on their own. Okay, uh, Nancy Drew, Miss Marple, Harriet Vane, Lady Molly, um, spunky heroines of Wilkie Collins and others. The character has been around for a long time, but here's the thing, she was an amateur. She was not gonna be somebody who had a license to be a detective. That would have been science fiction because in that era, it just wasn't gonna happen. Now, things changed with Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. Because here's the thing, um, Title VII prohibited gender discrimination in any federal, state, local government job, including the police, FBI, and other feds. Now, this is important because in fiction, private investigators were frequently ex-cops. Okay, that was the way that you, you, you got the job, that you had been in the police before. Um, Title VII suddenly said that the cops couldn't discriminate, that no one could discriminate. Um, if I want to su suggest to my students just how, how bad things were be before 1972, I tell them that I remember in college and in high school when I went to apply for part-time jobs, if you open the newspaper and look at the classified ads, on one side of the page, it said jobs for women. And on the other side of the page, it said jobs for men. My students don't even believe me. They said, that, they said you can't do that. That's illegal. I said, well, yeah, it's illegal because of Title VII, because feminists fought for this. And that's the reason why it's illegal now. Um, but it meant that cops had to hire, all right? And you know all the... Um, police forces and uh, uh, FBI, all, all the government agencies, um, had to have jobs open for women. Now, previous to this time, uh, police had requirements like height requirements, like you had to be five foot seven to be a cop. And they had to do away with that requirement because not a lot of women are five foot seven. Um, when this happened, there was a lot of protest. And a lot of uh, people saying it will never work. Women can never be cops. They're not tough enough. Um, when I was doing the research for this, what I found here around 1973 is if, if one woman cop did something stupid, it made headlines. It turns out that there were women cops whose, whose records ended up being just as good as the male records in terms of you know, getting the perps. But if one did something stupid, so okay, story of a woman cop who had her hair done and then refused to get out of her car to, uh, redirect some traffic around an accident because you didn't want to ruin her hair. This became like a major story, like, aha, here is proof that women can't do the jobs. It was one ridiculous woman and one stupid story. Uh, many, many other stories said that, of course, women can do the job. And of course, they're, they're, they're fine. But there was quite a lot of resistance. So in 1972, women were one half percent, that is 0.5 percent of people in police forces of any kind, both local and, and federal. Um, 10 years later, that had gone up to 10%. Right now, it's around 20%. So it's still a minority, except, of course, if you look on TV, it, play, it uh, shows like CSI, where the teams always have <laughs> far more women than men. <laughs> but that, of course, is that's, uh, that, that's television. That, that, that's the fantasy. Um, as you can still see, that's quite a big jump and it happened because of Title VII. Now, because of that, it was possible to imagine that women could be private investigators in fiction. And in 1982, 10 years after Title VII, the first professional women book series began. They were introduced by Sue Grafton, Marsha Muller, and Sarah Paretsky. And you know, Sue Grafton died just recently, but had been writing Full Tilt Boogie ever since. Uh, Marsha Muller and Sarah Paretsky are still writing. This was really significant, really significant, because these three women started series because they said, okay, look, we could be a series of like, you know, for, uh, for Mickey Spillane, you know, a series for uh, Sam Archer. Well, Sam Spade, why can't there be a series of women who were professional detectives who were, uh, who were on the scene who could have book after book? And in fact, that's what they did. And it, it certainly started to trend. Uh, between then and now, there has been a publishing boom in women detectives. Um, as of today, 
there are more than 400 series, series. Okay, not just 400 books, 400 series. I can't keep up with them. There are too many to keep up with. A hundred of these characters are professionals, which means they're private investigators, cops, federal agents, sheriffs, forensics experts, federal marshals. Um, I'm, I've listed here, here, let me once again move this out of the way. Um, I've listed some of, some of my favorites, but there are many, many more. Oh my gosh. Um, and the women are all kinds of things. They're forensics investigators, uh, they're cops, they're, they're private investigators. Um, also very interesting is that there are all kinds of women who are imagined as these characters, straight, gay, old, young, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, all body types and shapes. Um, they're not they're not all white guys. <laughs> um, the, um, the diversity is amazing. It's really thrilling. And they're everywhere and they're really, really popular. Uh, what's the appeal? So what, why has this grown? Why are so many people reading this? Um, and what's the specific appeal of the woman detective? Well, it's an alternative to romance. Now, it's true that uh, romance novels still outsell any mystery novels. They're a huge part of the um, of trade publishing. So, there you know the romance novels are still out there. But this alternative to romance is really interesting. Specifically, her her job and her um, uh, her story have nothing to do with romance. She may or may not have a partner, a boyfriend. Um, but her job is to, to solve the crime. And what she looks like doesn't matter. It's not what drives the plot line. This is, this is really important. Uh, little girls grew up, and I think still grow up, uh, hearing stories, once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. Now, I know that Shrek really made a dent in that, you know, and, and I'm glad that Shrek is out there. But it seems to me that the beautiful princess stories are still very, very much around. And the... Uh, the impetus of that story is, if you are beautiful, you have a story. That is, if you're attractive, you're going to be in the romance plot, okay? And that's kind of a prerequisite for something to happen to you. That what's going to happen to you is that a man will be attracted to you. That is the story. For these stories, what women look like isn't the point at all. So Sue Grafton... Uh, throughout her whole series, and I think, she, did she get up to T or X? I can't remember how, how far she got along in the alphabet. You never find out what uh, 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 Kinsey Milhelm looks like. So, th so pretty soon, like around um, the, third, the third book, uh, clearly fans were asking, well, what does she look like? What does she look like? And so there's this great scene where uh, 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 Kinsey goes into the, uh, the bathroom mirror and does, she says she does an inventory of herself. And it says, um, nose, broken once, but still works, still blows. Um, <laughs> uh, eyes, doesn't need glasses yet. And then she gives a monkey face to herself in the mirror. And you realize that Sue Grafton is giving a monkey face to the, to the reader and saying, what she looks like doesn't make a difference. It doesn't. She's the smartest person in the room. She's the one who's going to figure out these murders. She's the one who's the most adventurous. She's the one who has the best ideas. That's the story. I think this is hugely appealing for women. It's hugely appealing. Uh, what she looks like doesn't make a difference. Okay, so some, some, some major points that I've made here. Uh, the point of the detective is that the detective sees things that other people miss. And the detective is the smart person who kind of puts together these observations. So the detective is someone who is looking, okay, is doing the looking. Therefore, what the detective looks like doesn't make a difference, okay, until we get to movies, okay, <laughs> until we get to movies and television. And here's, here, here's a clue that there was a problem. Silence of the Lambs was a hugely popular movie that won Academy Awards. It made a ton of money. Usually when things like this happen, there's a zillion imitations. So, you know, Halloween worked 30 years ago. It's, it, I think they're still making Halloweens, right? <laughs> okay, franchises out there. Pirates of the Caribbean, one was popular. You know, after that, there were 100 Pirates of the Caribbean. But despite the popularity of Silence of the Lambs, there have been very few first-run films featuring this character. Very, very few. Um, they've been the exception rather than the rule. 
So Hollywood hasn't gone out to remake this character over and over again. Uh, now, let me give you a little bit of a history of the woman detective character. Um, back in the, black, the age of black exploitation movies in the early 1970s, um, Pam Greer and uh, Tamara Dobson did play uh, uh, private investigators, you know, very, very sexy private investigators. And it's kind of interesting, the black culture was willing to picture this character on screen much sooner than, uh, than, than white Hollywood was. Um, in the late 80s, when it became clear that there were going to be women detectives in, uh, in literature, a couple movies came out that just weren't very good and didn't do very well at the box office. So we're looking at a very tenuous kind of a history. And then disaster. Sarah Paretsky sold the rights to her uh, V.I. Warshawski series and made a movie with uh, uh, Kathleen Turner. It was one of the worst movies ever. Ever. And it was a huge disappointment to Warshawski fans, just in terms of how the character was, was, was portrayed. I mean, uh, Kathleen Turner was at that point a really sexy, at, at the beginning of the 1990s, one of the sexiest actresses around. And it would have been okay for, for the character to be sexy on screen, but constant attention was paid to her legs, her looks. And it opened, the movie opened in a very disturbing way with the character getting out of bed, getting on the scale and saying, ooh, and then going up for a run. Now, here's the thing. In all her books, the VI character is trying to keep her weight up. She has to have some husk on her because she has to bump up against the bad guys sometimes and, and tackle people and she can't be skinny. She just can't get skinny. And so she has to kind of keep the muscle on her and keep the weight on her. So from that very opening scene, those of us who love the books realized this is a disaster. This is really, really not gonna work. Um, uh, uh, Sarah Paresky never spoke about this. Apparently she um, signed a contract that she would never speak about why she did it, why she, she made a ton of money. I'm sure that was the reason why she did it. There was only one movie, they will never do another one. And uh, uh, Sue Grafton uh, has sworn that her characters won't be made into movies. Now, uh, before she died, Sue Grafton and I were in correspondence a little bit. Of course, it didn't happen after she died. Of course, it would be before she died. <laughs> that would have been really interesting. Um, but she'd written to me several times saying that um, she doesn't want her movies, her, her books ever, ever to be turned into movies and TV because they'll be glamorized and they'll be made by committee and there won't be much choice about what the character looks like. So, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a real trend here at this thing about the danger of glamorization and glamorization being very much against the spirit of woman detective stories because what she looks like, of course, doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference. It's what she's thinking, what she sees. Okay, Signs of the Lambs in 1991 really was a big breakthrough for the woman detective character, but it does some really kind of interesting things. The film version totally deletes her romantic interests. So in the book, you might remember that she actually has a flirtation with one of the guys from the Smithsonian. And at the end of the book, she's in bed with them. That's the last page of the book. The last page of the book is, and she slept silently in this, in this, in the silence of she, she slept peacefully in the silence of the lambs, and she's there with this guy in bed. Notice that they they take away her heterosexuality entirely in the movie. And I think Jonathan Denny was trying very hard not to glamorize her, to make sure that she, she didn't become a, you know, a glamorous character. Um, the camera framings de-emphasize her body. So if you see the movie, notice that we almost never see her full body and full body shots. And when we do, it's only to have her kind of blend into the background or to emphasize how tiny she is. Um, her clothing frequently blends into the background, so we don't notice what she's wearing. I mean, really, really different from the Sarah Paretsky movie. Um, there's also some interesting things happening here. Clarice wants to be a detective. Buffalo Bill wants to be a woman. There's some kind of creepy sliding of gender roles here. Uh, remember the, the whole thing about don't get a Hannibal Lecter into your head, and there's that shot of Hannibal Lecter, of course, getting into her head. So we have this whole thing of um, the detective's attraction to the criminal. Uh, but it works differently with Clarice because she's going to be judged really differently. And we also have this whole thing about the unnatural characters. I mean, Hannibal is the cannibal, uh, Buffalo Bill um, uh, uh, skins women's bodies. 
Um, Clarice is there with them, you know, as, as a woman doing something that women don't usually do, especially in 1991 to join the FBI. Um, so, so there is some, I think, nervous, some gender nervousness in the film, but it's a really, really good movie. Okay. And she really does do really good uh, examples of seeing what men miss. Okay. After Silence of the Lambs, there were a couple ambitious films in the 90s. Fargo, really excellent. Uh, Copycat is a very good, very scary detective movie that really kind of takes the Silence of the Lambs pattern. That is, there's a, a psychologist who's played by Sojourney Weaver. There's a cop who's Holly Hunter. The two of them combine forces to, uh, to, to get the killer. It's good. It's very, very good. Uh, but think about a 10 year period where there were only two of these movies. So we're, we're not seeing Hollywood jumping on the bandwagon for the woman detective. Uh, Bone Collector. Well, Bone Collector was kind of interesting, but it went to that old gender pattern. Man is the mind, the woman is the body because the detective uh, who is the uh, Denzel Washington character is paralyzed, he's in the hospital and it's the cop, uh, Angelina Jolie, who of course is all body who goes out and solves the crimes for him. Um, so, you know, it's kind of some, some interesting things happening there. Uh, by the end of the nineties, there was a turn toward glitz and comedy with women who were investigators. Um, and in the 2000s, there were some bad movies, <laughs> just bad movies. I went to see Twisted in the, uh, in the movie theater. It was a fairly crowded movie theater. It just wasn't a very good movie. And uh, these movies keep trying to make the woman as you know, heterosexual as possible. So the Ashley Judd character has a guy on the police force with her who's who has a crush on her and um, is kind of following her around and kind of yearning after her. So at the end of the, the movie, when she shoots the criminal dead, she says, she says, I got the guy, I got the guy. Well, Andy Garcia, the other cop wanders into the room and says, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. It was so awful. The people in the theater just screamed and booed. I've never seen that in a movie theater before. It's like, oh no, this is really corny, really awful. But once again, there was this thing about trying to glamorize the character and also to make her romantic. And of course, these are the things that the woman detective in these many, many, many literary novels does not do, okay? She doesn't have a romance as part of her story. And what she looks like just isn't very important. Um, Untraceable, actually, this is a little bit better. Uh, this is Diane Lane, who is slightly older, okay? And maybe for that reason, less glamorized. Uh, and I gotta say that the Larson series, remember the girl with the dragon tattoo, the girl who played with fire, the movie versions were very good, okay? And she is really one, kick-ass investigator, uh, really an incredible character. And um, I was really worried what they would do with the movie versions. The movie versions were all pretty, pretty good. But once again, there, there are fairly few of them. Now, television has a better history of women detectives. Uh, television has always been used as kind of a clearinghouse of ideas because there are so many episodes uh, that you can kind of play with and experiment with. So characters can be developed over time uh, because there are uh, you know, uh, episodes and, and years that that can happen. Audiences can grow and audiences can change. Uh, the casting, the characters, the stories can change in response to ratings. So as a result, um, uh, producers have been willing to put money into uh, t uh, television female detectives much more than producers have been willing to put out the money for, uh, for movies. So very early on, do you remember Cagney and Lacey? Do you remember originally Meg Foster starred as Cagney? And okay, you won't believe this, but she was taken out because a couple years previously, she had played a lesbian in a movie and the producers thought that she brought too much of a lesbian character to her, uh, to Cagney. Um, Cagney was not in any way a lesbian character. Remember, she was pretty promiscuous. There were always a lot of men in her life. Um, but what they did was they said, okay, you know, we can switch this out, replace her with Sharon Gless, who was considered more feminine. Gless is the one there on the left. I have no idea why she was considered more feminine. Um, this is also a really good example of a show that um, got good ratings, but the producers weren't sure about it. They were going to cancel it. There was so much fan mail and so much protest. And this was back in the 80s. It was before social media. So these are people just writing letters and making phone calls to the studios that they did, in fact, keep it on the air. It went on to win multiple Emmy Awards. But once again, there was, a, you know, they were nervous. Here are two women who 
do not have romance as their story. You know, one was married, the other one had romances in the background, but they were out to get the bad guys and they did. And the producers thought, oh, maybe this would just be too threatening to be on TV. No, it wasn't. Um, it was also kind of the uh, uh, exception for what was happening with women detectives on television. There had been some early investigators, like in the very, very early uh, 60s with uh, Honey West and the Avengers. Um, and then after Title VII, this is kind of interesting, <laughs> there were very sexy women police people on TV. And I think they were trying to say, okay, okay, women can be cops, but look, they can still run really fast in high heels. They can still look really good constantly. They will still go out and get coffee for the guys. Uh, so we had these very kind of glammed up hypersexual women who were on TV. And that actually has continued to be the case. Um, Get Christy Love was the sassy uh, maverick African-American female dick um, lasted only one season. Okay, that was going to be way too much for people to be able to accept. Uh, in the 80s, much more acceptable was the screwball couple. So once again, if romance was incorporated into it, okay, that made it more palatable with Remington Steele and Moonlighting. Remington, I mean, they were both favorites of, of mine. I, I really enjoyed both of them. They were so much fun. You might remember that Remington Steele is a story of a woman, uh, a private investigator who gets no business at all. Nobody wants to go to a private invest a woman female investigator. So she makes up a name. She said she was using her Remington typewriter and the Steelers were on TV. So she said, okay, this agency is going to be called Remington Steel. Pierce Brosnan, yes, that is a young baby Pierce Brosnan, simply kind of shows up at the door and asks if she needs help. And here's the thing, he's dumb as dirt. So she's the one who's the brains of the outfit. This guy couldn't tell a footprint from a, a fingerprint. <laughs> and um, he's the one who's around who, he never rescues her, but they're a team, they're a funny team. And generally comedy works. So we're seeing ways that uh, this character becomes less threatening, you know, if she's in a romance, okay, and if she's very conventionally attractive. Now, in the early 90s, Prime Suspect was on TV, and it was on the BBC, and she was the first really serious woman television detective. And once again, this is the BBC. The BBC doesn't use sponsors. They don't have to worry about sponsors paying money. So BBC television is known for having ordinary people as stars. Now, of course, we know that uh, Helen Mirren can, can glam up and can be incredibly glamorous when she wants to be. She could also be very plain as she was in, in this series. Uh, and generally, BBC is pretty good about that. Um, if you want to see, you know, people who actually look like us, watch BBC, <laughs> watch their mysteries, and you'll, 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 see, you'll see this constantly. Um, also in the early 90s, remember X-Files and Profiler, very smart, minimally glamorized heroines. And in fact, uh, Dana Scully was really modeled after Clarice. So uh, in the way that she dressed and in a lot of the... Um, uh, characterizations very early on. She was a kind of a Clarice character. The summer of 2004, Karen Sisko becomes the first series since Honey West to be named for the woman investigator. It's a shame that this didn't last very long. It was, it was actually a good series. Um, it was a spinoff from the 98 film Out of Sight. That was good. That was good. If you want to see a really good woman detective, it's um, Jennifer Lopez, one of her very first movies, one of uh, Clooney's very first movies. And he's the criminal that she has to catch. <laughs> okay. uh, and once again, she is able to put her job before the romance. So interesting, interesting movie. Um, woman detectives are now pretty standard on detective teams on TV. As I said, there are more of them on TV than there are actually in real life. Um, uh, there was Crossing Jordan, okay, that combined the forensics of Patricia Cornwell, the character of Grafty's Kinsey Milhone. Um, there was also Cold Case, uh, Catherine Morris playing a very brilliant, no-nonsense homicide cop. So there, there have been some over the years. Um, Bones was from the forensics novels of Kathy Reich. In those novels, Kathy Reich's heroine is middle-aged and she has a daughter who's grown. When they put her on TV, she lost 
20 years, okay, <laughs> um, was single, was in a romance, very, very different from the character in, in the book. It was a fun series, but we're seeing a pattern here that once this, these series turn into either movies or TV shows, there's glamour and there's romance in a way that there aren't in the literary versions. Um, Overall, you know, I think you could say that television takes bigger risks, uh, frequently with um, uh, also having some older actresses play um, uh, play woman detectives. Um, but usually the bottom line is glamour. Okay, I'm going to have you look at these two characters. Look at this. Uh, on the left is Emily Deschanel, who uh, stars as Temperance Brennan on Bones. And then look on the right, that is Stena uh, Kadik, who plays Detective Beckett on Castle. They look like the same person, don't they? I mean, don't they look like the exact same person? <laughs> the long hair, you know, the very feminine hairstyle. And, you know, even though they're wearing kind of tailored clothes, you know, very, very feminine in appearance. Um, so, you know, my point here is the glamour seems to be the thing that for the most part they are going for. Now, some exceptions. Uh, BBC did put out um, a version of the Inspector Lindley series, and I'll tell you what, Elizabeth George is my favorite woman detective author, and uh, her characters are Inspector Lindley, who is um, uh, with the, um, uh, the the London police, and his, uh, his partner, the cop, Barbara Havers, is a very sloppy, plain-faced, um, chubby, detective who is absolutely brilliant. She's a wonderful, wonderful character. I was disappointed that she was cutened up, <laughs> even for the BBC cutened her up when they, they did this series. Um, some very good female detectives on TV who were absolutely not glamorized. The Killing was a series that was on AMC. Uh, Top of the Lake uh, was uh, a series that was originally BBC. Uh, they were both excellent, just excellent. You can see that Elizabeth Moss is the one who uh, was in Top of the Lake. Uh, Broadchurch, another really good, very non-glamorous woman investigator on TV. So they're they're you know they're around occasionally. Um, another really good adaptation. Uh, Alexandra McCall Smith has a series called The Number One Ladies Detective Agency that takes place in Africa, and the um, the detective is a large exceptionally smart, exceptionally humorous and attractive woman um, who solves all kinds of mysteries. Um, the very prestigious director, Anthony Minghella, the guy who directed The English Patient, bought the movie rights and could not get the movie produced because no one would put up the money. They said, no one is gonna watch a movie about a large African woman who's a detective. They wouldn't do it. So they instead did a TV series, a BBC series uh, starring Jill Scott that's very good. Uh, usually BBC productions are around, you can find them someplace. And I bet the, once again, the library that has copies of, of these DVDs. But I very much recommend that. She breaks all the rules for what a detective is supposed to look like. She is absolutely brilliant and it's a very, very fun series. Um, but we're seeing a pattern here about the literary versus on-screen woman detectives, that the book series has this incredible diversity of characters, diversity of bodies, age, race, ethnicity, sexuality, looks, nationality, everything. Um, it's a really diverse group and they're not glamorous. There are a couple, I think, who were, um, who were strikingly pretty, but they're actually the exceptions, <laughs> okay? You know, for the most part, they are not. Um, Whereas once you get into movies and television, we're gonna see quite a bit of glamor. They end up being glammed up. So um, why is this happening? Well, for movies in particular, um, but I, but I, I, I think this, this, would, this would also go for TV. Let's think about who this woman character would be as the detective and how all the qualities that worked for the male detective would work against the woman detective. She's an outsider. Well, for a woman to be an outsider is not as cool as for a man to be an outsider. All right. So that works against her. She's a woman of action. Well, that sounds like she's pushy. She has a shady past. Well, that could work for a guy. 
But for a woman, not so much. Her job entails violence. Well, that's the bad girl. Um, she's a would-be outlaw. Well, that's the femme fatale, certainly not a positive character. She can treat Ned badly. Oh my gosh, maybe she's a lesbian. Of course, and that's that's been the fear that we've seen over and over again with um, with the television version in particular. Uh, so you know, you put her into a heterosexual partnership or a romance in order to prove that that isn't true. <coughs> uh, it's very much the threat of the anti-romance story. Okay, these women have a story of their own. It does not involve men. Well, I mean. Producers who are putting up money for this are going to be nervous about a story that does that. <coughs> the solution has been to glamorize her, to guarantee that she's feminine, and to put her into a romantic couple. Now, economics gives TV the edge. In 2022, look at these stats. A first-run movie budget was $80 million. <coughs> Even a low-budget movie can cost $5 million. But television series can have multiple sponsors and more chances for success. With a movie, you just have two hours <coughs> to develop the character. With the TV series, you can do a whole lot more. <coughs> I am sorry. <coughs> I'm getting over COVID. <coughs> but I am going to try to finish this. Um, as we said, the woman det detective character is someone who is doing the looking and not, uh, not being looked at. But it's hard for Hollywood to, I think, accept that. <coughs> and then, of course, we have the story of female curiosity being both <coughs> Pandora's box and also Adam and Eve. And they're both stories in which women get punished for being curious. So we can see that there's a really rich reason to continue with this character, a reason she's probably going to be popular for a really long time. And if you haven't read some women detective stories, I hope you do. Thank you. Linda, thank you so much for <laughs> presenting to us and joining us and giving us this information today. We're so very grateful to you. We hope you recover quickly and we thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks to all who joined us today. We look forward to seeing you attend more of our virtual and in-person programs. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact the library. Keep watching our social media and our Facebook page and our website. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.